Starting off this list in our number 10 spot, we have Pope Gregory the Ninth. Pope Gregory the Ninth was the Bishop of Rome and the ruler of the Papal States from 1227 until his passing in 1241. The Papal States were a series of territories in the Italian peninsula that were under direct rule of the Pope from the 8th century all the way to 1870. It turns out that Pope Gregory the Ninth had a very strange hatred for cats. He said that black cats were actually instruments of Satan, which seems a little extreme, but then he actually went as far as to order that they be exterminated throughout Europe, which is definitely a little extreme. With this order, the Pope's followers had to oblige, and there was a drastic reduction in the cat population. But of course, this caused a disturbance to the ecosystem, and the time and the consequence of that became very evident. Because of the decline of cats, there was a sudden increase in the amount of rats, most of which may have been carrying the plague. There are a lot of historians who would argue that this war on cats may have had a huge effect on the severity of the Black Plague. That is, of course, speculation as it's pretty difficult to pinpoint who could be at fault for something like that, but it certainly is a very interesting point. This all really does, however, bring me to my next point. In our number 9 spot today, we have the Black Death. I'm sure we've all heard of the Black Death at some point or another. I mean, how could we possibly ever stop talking about something like that? During the 1340s, there was an outbreak of the bubonic plague that spread rapidly throughout Europe and Asia. It was called the Black Plague because of the fact that this illness would cause people's lymph nodes to to become swollen and black. The Black Death was absolutely terrible and it caused a lot of agony for those who had to go through it. Symptoms included things like severe body aches, fever, vomiting, and eventual death in most cases. There was no cure for the plague, so it just continued to spread. In the end, the Black Death took the lives of hundreds of millions of people. We now all know firsthand what it is like to live through a pandemic, and I certainly wouldn't sign up to do it again anytime soon, so I'm most definitely sure the times of the Black Death were some of the worst times in history. Apparently it is said that if you lived in the 1340s, there was basically a 50-50 chance that you'd survive the Black Death. And then on top of that, there's all of the other horrifying ways to die that the medieval times held. All in all, I'm kind of shocked that we're still here today. In our number 8 spot today, we have the Mongol invasion. Being in China during the Mongol invasion certainly was a terrifying time. I'm sure a lot of us here have heard at least some of the stories surrounding Genghis Khan, but if you haven't, let's just say that being on his bad side certainly wasn't a good thing for you. In 1205, when the Mongol invasion in China began, it was the regular citizens of China who paid the ultimate price. What was started by Genghis Khan was carried on by his son and then his grandson, which ultimately led to a 74 year long campaign that was filled with brutality and destruction. Cities and towns were destroyed, empires were brought down, and millions of completely innocent people lost their lives. It is believed that this invasion took the lives of enough people to cut the population in half from 120 million before to just 60 million after. Anyone living in China at this time would have had to live in absolute fear of being killed for something that you really had nothing to do with. That would be awful and absolutely terrifying. Number 7. The Rack On to something not so hot and fast, but rather dull and slow, the Rack is surprisingly well known. It was originally introduced to the Tower of London around 1420. The Duke of Exeter referred to this device as his daughter. What a weirdo. It's like guys who call their car like she. It's like, okay, this is a little bit too close to your automobile, man. Relax. It was an open bed frame type device where your ankles were tied at the bottom and your hands were tied at the top. Already we're off to a horrible start. It was horizontal as well and sometimes it was up. It was, it was all bad. It would just leave you hanging by these ropes and these ropes were slowly tightened more and more, obviously causing some problems to muscles and joints that were, you know, holding things in place. This was done to extract information. This is also one of the worst things I've heard. Even getting tickled like this would be horrible. I couldn't even imagine. I make jokes because I'm uncomfortable. Honestly, hit that thumbs up to spread some good vibes because we're not even halfway done. In our number six spot today, we have King Charles the Sixth. King Charles the Sixth started off his reign by being very well loved and respected, but as time went on over his four decades of ruling, he ended up being known as Charles the Mad. His erratic behavior had him hacking up knights, imagining that he was Saint George, and he would also have bouts of amnesia where he would be able to recognize some people, but not his wife and children. This is all very strange and of course quite sad as he was obviously exhibiting signs of extreme mental illness, but one of the strangest symptoms was him believing that he was made of glass. He was terribly 
really frightened of falling or being jostled too hard, and he would actually insert iron rods into his clothing to try and keep himself from shattering. But then he would also apparently run wild at top speeds throughout the halls of the castle or the streets, which would obviously mean that he was completely abandoning his fear of fragility. It apparently got so bad that he had to be held inside with the entrances blocked off. Sadly, he continued on this path until he passed away in 1422. Number 5 Nothing is true, everything is permitted. The Medici family didn't exactly live around the medieval times, but fairly close. That being said, the family is something similar to the Kardashians of today. No, not a hit reality show based around wealthy women who sit around their mansion all day looking for a good verbal argument. No, but rather a well-known family who had extreme wealth and as time went on gained a lot more wealth and power. The Medici got their wealth by being successful bankers. And when you got money, you got power. And they owned a lot of property and had clients in multiple cities. Some family members would later become royalty like Catherine de Medici, and even more powerful by some family members becoming next to the Lord himself as the Pope. Which if you're into that sort of thing, you would know how serious that position really is. What I'm getting at is, you don't get that powerful without breaking a few eggs. They used money and power to manipulate and they got their way. In our number 4 spot today we have William the Conqueror. In 1087, William the Conqueror decided to take on an all alcohol diet. This is because he was suffering from extreme obesity and was struggling because of that fact. Because of this, he told his staff that he would only drink wine until his weight went down, but he ended up passing away less than a year later. And most of us are told that obviously Obviously, this was because of the wine only diet, that's actually not true. In an astonishing turn of events, this wine only diet actually worked. Shortly after beginning his diet, he was able to ride his horse again, which was one of the main reasons he started the diet in the first place, as he was previously too heavy for the horse to carry. He actually died after falling from his horse during an expedition, which was completely unrelated to either his weight or his diet. It's entirely possible that had he not gone on this diet, he would have never ridden his horse and maybe would have lived longer? Truthfully, who knows. But I suppose in a very roundabout way, he did still kind of die from his wine only diet. Number three, rats. Another Game of Thrones classic. If you're a rat person, I know there's a lot of people who do tricks with their pet rat. That's cool, but maybe cover Stuart Little's eyes for this one. Rats as a medieval punishment, where do I even start? Okay, this one was a punishment for the rats at the same time. What was once called a rat trap involved a man or woman being tied down to something and then a metal enclosure would be strapped down to their chest or their stomach. Now inside this metal enclosure, there's rats, which are also just loose walking around and the person can feel them, the little feet walking around in their skin. And this is when the person instilling the punishment begins heating the other end of the metal enclosure Historically, it was hot coals that were usually placed on top or there's a fire underneath, which quickly creates a hot environment for the rats inside. From there, the rats begin frantically searching for a way out, but because it's made of metal and they can't bite through that, they find your skin and then that they can obviously bite through, so you can paint the picture in your head. In our number two spot today, we have Mansa Musa. Mansa Musa was a deputy to the ruler of the Mali Empire, but when the ruler went missing while on a sea voyage to find the edge of the Atlantic Ocean, Mansa Musa became the ruler in 1312. During his rule, European nations were really struggling due to civil wars and a lack of resources, but the Mali Empire was flourishing because of their abundance of resources like gold and salt. Under his rule, the empire Empire grew to take up a large portion of West Africa as he conquered 24 cities and their surrounding districts. At this time, Mali was one of the top producers of gold in the entire world, which left Mansa Musa as one of the wealthiest historical figures ever. One of the most well known events during his rule was the pilgrimage to Mecca. This journey took place from 1324 to 1325 and spanned an estimated 4,000 miles, and it was the first time people outside of the empire saw just how wealthy he was. He traveled with 60,000 of his men all wearing Persian silk along with 12,000 slaves who each carried 4 pounds of gold bars and he also brought heralds who had golden staffs along with a bunch of camels and horses. This pilgrimage had a profound effect on Egypt as this huge group of people passed through. From the markets in Cairo to the royals to the impoverished people that crossed their path, Musa left Cairo littered with so much gold that it depreciated the value of the metal 
in Egypt, and it took decades for them to recover. In our number one spot today, we have St. Marcellus's Flood. This was actually a very serious extratropical cyclone that swept through around January 16th, 1362. This cyclone eerily matched up with the new moon, and it spanned through the British Isles, the Netherlands, northern Germany, and Denmark. Here's the thing, this storm not only lined up with the moon, but also peaked on the feast day of St. Marcellus, which is the reason it got its name, but usually people refer to this one as the second, because there is another. The first St. Marcellus flood took the lives of 36,000 people as it swept through the northern Netherlands in 1219. The second flood, however, while no one is sure the exact numbers, it is estimated that at least 250,000 people lost their lives. While there have been plenty of devastating floods in history, this one is said to be blamed on Atlantic gales and that this event goes hand in hand with the great wind of 1362. Number 10. Gucci to the Socks Man of Musa may be the richest human to have ever walked planet Earth. The ninth emperor of the Mali Empire made his massive fortune by exploiting his country's salt and gold production. It is estimated his wealth today would be worth $400 billion US. That is a lot of money. That is a lot of shkarol. It is, however, difficult to place an exact number on his wealth, as this was a very long time ago, and it is difficult to separate his wealth from the actual monarch itself. However, in his travels in hopes of securing new trade deals, he wanted to show off his good faith and wealth. When he arrived in Mecca, it was time for a shopping spree, where the wealthy king spent so much gold it actually ruined the economy. Yeah, it ruined the economy of Mecca. Honestly, that's just a big Bruce Wayne play right there. Imagine spending so much money, you single-handedly raise the inflation rate in a major city. And also a few others. He, that wasn't the only place he did it, surprisingly. He also bragged at one point that gold grows like plants where he's from. Where I'm from, it's super cold and there's lots of snow. We aren't selling snow yet, right? Number nine. Bad Vlad. Vlad the Impaler is Vlad the Impaler. Okay, sure, he wasn't the wealthiest king ever and his empire wasn't that big. But listen, I called the chief last night and he said he ain't it. Vlad was best known for his creative um, punishments to say the least. Vlad was just the kind of guy who took some folks he didn't like and, you know, impaled them with large wooden or steel stakes. Vladdy did not discriminate either. While a lot of poor people did end up with the worst suppository ever, he also ended up unaliving some wealthier folk too. This one time at band camp, Vlad had two guys come visit, and when he asked them to remove their hats, as was custom in Vlad's kingdom, they refused, which in hindsight was a really bad idea, because then Vlad had their hats nailed to their heads, so that they may never remove them again. What were poor people going to do? Try and overthrow the guy who left their family members on pikes as some really weird art installation? Truth be told, I've heard too much about this guy for me to even come close to his kingdom. I'm good over here. I don't need to be anywhere near him. You stay over there, I'll be over here. It's all good. Number eight, Return of the Mac. Okay, so you guys know Rome, right? Beautiful ancient city, monuments, aqueducts, a big scary army with red brooms on top of their heads for some reason. Mamma mia, it's beautiful. But it didn't last forever. After many years of conquest and living well, it eventually decayed and sort of split in half with the west and east. The east becoming known as the Byzantine Empire, which it honestly did pretty well for itself too. This includes the adventures of Basil II. He's nicknamed the Bulgar Slayer. For video games out there, Doom Slayer is a big dude in green armor that does what exactly? slays demons. So that means Basil slays Bulgars. Huh? Yeah, real nice dude. With his financial might and power, he was able to conquer Bulgaria, which lasted a long time actually. And by the time of his death, Basil was the wealthiest man in Byzantine. A classic tale of a man in charge exploiting and pillaging those less fortunate. In our number seven spot today, we have Pope Formosus and Pope Stephen VI. Pope Formosus was the ruler of the Papal States from October 6th, 891, until he passed away on April 4th, 896. After his passing, Pope Boniface VI took his place as ruler for just a few weeks before he also passed away, 
which then left Pope Stephen VI as the ruler from then on until his death. After this whirlwind April of 1896, things got even weirder. Before his passing, Pope Formosus had sided with Arnulf of Carinthia against Lambert of Spoleto, which was definitely not okay with Pope Stephen VI. So once Pope Stephen VI gets to the place of being the ruler, he gets the people to exhume the body of Pope Formosus so that he can put him on trial. I feel like this is very gross and very unnecessary, but this really is the type of stuff that went on in the 800s. They propped the body up for trial and had a deacon and answer questions for him since he obviously was unable to do that himself. They ended up finding the corpse guilty, which seems a little unfair, and they actually went as far as to strip the body of its sacred vestments, took three fingers from the right hand as they were the blessing fingers, they dressed the body in regular people clothes instead of the clothing a pope would be buried in, and then they reburied the body. If this poor man's body hadn't been through enough, it was later re-exhumed again and thrown into the river. If this story wasn't already wild enough, this whole debacle is actually what would later end up getting Pope Stephen imprisoned and then killed, all right? So I guess the other Pope had his justice in the end. I don't know, man. Number six, the cowardly lion. Richard I was the king of England for a decent amount of time, but didn't spend a lot of time of it in England. He spent most of his time raising taxes so he could fund his international warmongering. After all, that's kind of what history is about. History doesn't usually remember the times we were super friendly and got along. Which brings us to the Crusades. After recapturing Acre in 1191, his enemy Saladin was considering options of what to do next, and also considering uh, prisoner swaps, which actually was common for the time. Sadly, Saladin may have been taken too long, or may have been planning a re-retake of the city, because Richard had waited too long. Not sure what Saladin was up to, he took prisoners from Acre who were poor civilians and soldiers up onto a nearby hill in full view of Saladin and slaughtered 3,000 people. He's remembered for being Richard the Lionheart for his bravery. All I'm saying is that it's not very brave to kill innocent poor civilians. War as hell, I guess. Number five, keel hauling. Not to be confused with kegels, keel hauling was reserved for the worst of the worst at sea. This was used by pirates for sailors who disobeyed orders and all that jazz. The victim would be suspended by a rope with rocks or weights around their ankles, then they're lowered to the keel of the ship where all the sharp barnacles live. After so long, these ships are so old, it's just piled on layers and layers of barnacles. Then they would get dragged all along them with the water and everything. Water plus pain, it's a lot. It's a deadly combination. Anything to do with barnacles in the sea, no chance. I'll literally tell you anything, Blackbeard. Anything. Number four, diaper sniper. All right, this one's messed up, but that's just how things were. Marriage is a beautiful matrimony between two loving people that has a harmonious lasting lifetime. Tell that to people in divorce court and see where that gets you. While we may marry for love today, things were a little bit different back in the oldie times. Marriage was oftentimes a business opportunity or a peace treaty of sorts, and other versions of marriage would have you on a certain dateline show with Chris Hansen. I'm talking about girls getting married at the old refined age of 12. Yuck. It's just how it was. At the time, that was considered the age of maturity, but I mean, if you only live until you're 35, it kind of makes sense, I guess. While most of these cases are from poor people, at the end of the day, they were women and simply could not own business and property that men could. So it's in the best interest that a wealthy man marries a poor girl. Gotta do what you gotta do, I guess. In our number three spot today, we have Olga of Kiev. Olga of Kiev became queen regent in 945 CE after her husband was killed and during the time her son was too young to rule just yet. Olga knew that once her son was old enough to be crowned king, her power would be taken away, so she needed to see her wishes carried out before that happened. Her wishes included the capturing and killing of those who took the life of her husband, which was carried out by using scalding hot water. Yeah. Don't even want to imagine what that would have been like. Don't kill the king, I guess. Historically, it really doesn't seem to work out well. Apparently, in doing this, however, Olga developed a bit of a bloodthirst, and she would not rest until everyone associated with the people who killed her husband were all eliminated. It seemed like if you even looked in the wrong direction or breathed in the vicinity of someone who had something to do with the king's slang, you could kiss your own life goodbye. Olga took hundreds of people out of the tribe that the killers were from. She divided 
devised a plan to bury the tribe leaders alive, and she even came up with a plan to set fire to their entire village. It is said that Olga may have locked the tribe's leaders in a bathhouse and burned it down, but we don't know for sure. All we do know is that she definitely was not okay. Number 2. Do you require a bowel movement, sir? Kings will be kings, and sometimes they do some things that shouldn't be things. Meet the royal groom of the stool, a man who must follow the king around with a ye olde porta potty, or really just a bull, where he would be ready to assist the royal in a release of his bowels. Originally created by King Henry VIII, the groom's job was to assist the king with a box to relieve himself, also carrying towels and water, even monitoring the outcome of such daily events. After all, he's the king, gotta keep tabs on his diet. It's also rumored that the kings may have even required assistance in hygiene after the fact. Which, I mean, come on, I know we all need help sometimes, but that's a tad much. With all the disease and not hand washing at the time, I'm not really sure anyone ate food ever again. Ooh. Number 1. Dead End Job Wiping a royal bum is tough, but cleaving a man's head from his body kinda sucks too. The rich uphold the law, and that means when it's time for the death penalty, somebody's gotta do it. Somebody with less money and somebody who might not have a choice as professional unalivers at the time often were handed down the blood soaked acts of their kin. On one hand, you have law and order that is respected. On the other hand, you have a profession that sees law and order through, but is not that well respected. Makes sense that the job kinda sucks though. Unalivers often had to practice their skills and eventually worked their way up to the real McCoy. Practicing on pumpkins, animals, and eventually criminals. If they got it wrong, i.e. too many swings of the axe, people would rush and attack their unaliver. Despite what movies and cartoons may make you think, these people did have empathy for what they were doing, and because of their social status, a lot of them lived lonely lives. Kicking off the list at number 10. Boiling. Whenever I get in a bath that's too hot, I think of the medieval times. I can't help it. I can't believe this was once a real thing. I get chills thinking about it. Either water or oil would be used for this ancient punishment. To die by being boiled, that was reserved for those who poisoned others. So if you have any vials of poison, toss it. Don't do it, man. Trust me. In 1531, the time King Henry VIII was running the show, they made boiling a capital punishment. So poisoning somebody back then was equal to treason. Therefore, it was agreed you should be boiled slowly in front of of like a room full of people. I would say that's the worst, but I know what's also to come on this list. Number nine, water. Taking a step away from the worst physical thing one could possibly go through, let's take a look at how far the mind will go before it too breaks. Sensory deprivation is still around today. In fact, there's many who pay for it. Yeah, they lie in a dark tub full of salt, then they float and listen to Childish Gambino. It's a magical experience. Your senses are powerful, especially combined with water. So this dripping machine, this old water punishment, that was just all bad. You had ice cold water dripping on your forehead and your face over and over for hours and hours. Drops would be at different random time so you can predict it as well. My toes are wiggling while I'm talking about this. This is making me anxious right now. In medieval times, they would tie you down and then using a horn, a big ass funnel, they would pour nine pints of water down into your, down your, down your throat. So water is horrible in many ways. Number eight, fire. Can't talk about medieval punishments without mentioning this witchy classic. Commonly practiced in Babylonia and ancient Israel, then later on in Europe with the classic witch hunts, burning at the stake didn't come from churches, like many believe. They didn't call the shots there at all. That was mainly how small towns settled local beef. Yeah, by burning at the stake, instead of just like a fist fight at the park. Burning at the stake came in full swing way back in 1431 in France. French disbelievers like Joan of Arc, they were burned at the stake. It was crazy that they actually did this as a form of punishment. This is one of the worst medieval punishments, and believe me, there's a little bit of a silver lining here. It was quicker than most. Sometimes. Gunpowder was sometimes used so that the burning and stuff would be much faster and brighter and louder and much more horrible. A lot worse on paper, but a lot faster. So honestly, I think it's better. History is insane. Another red hot punishment used in medieval times was when the accused had to hold a red hot iron bar and then walk a few steps with it. A red hot iron bar, your hands were literally toast at that point. Here's where it gets even worse though. Three days later, the accused would come back to the court and then when the bandages were removed, if their hands were healing, they started to heal, they were deemed innocent. They were on the path to goodness and whatever. If their hands were still in horrible condition from say, I don't know, holding a red hot iron bar, then they were pronounced guilty. That's how the courts worked back then. Number seven, off with his belly. King Henry VIII was a guy known for a few shady things. Removing your wife's head because you want a new wife isn't exactly the nicest way to go about divorce. 
I can think of some nasty other stuff too. I don't know what the f I'm saying. I think what was rather more interesting, however, was the king's diet and the quality of life divide between royalty and peasants, especially compared to the average person at the time. Sure, he was the king, but the list of foods and menus that were available to him were crazy, even by today's standards, almost rivaling the wealthy of today. His banquets would often include pork, chicken, fish, goose, beef, fruit, bread, and desserts galore. Extravagant desserts with beautiful designs. And of course, you gotta have some wine to wash that all down with, which funny enough might have made them healthier to drink wine since water purification at the time wasn't so great. It is said he was consuming way more than the average person's calorie intake. Also, not to mention his food was fresh, or as fresh as it could be for the time. And if it wasn't, it was seasoned and preserved with very expensive spices from the far reaches of the globe. Spices that no normal person can get their hands on. The average person may not have been starving, but the quality of food and lack of fresh proteins show you what the almighty gold coin can do. Could someone please pass me the turkey? Folks. Number six, molten metal. This was another form of capital punishment, and if you've seen Game of Thrones, it'll ring a familiar bell. A few of these do, actually. Yikes. Metal would be heated up in a cauldron for a long, long time to the point where it was liquid. It was molten metal, just a soup of minerals. Look, we said this video wasn't for the faint-hearted, and here at Bumblebee, we like to keep that promise. They would then pour the molten metal on your head, or more commonly known, this would they pour it down the throat of the accused. Obviously, it wasn't done as a method to extract information, it was done to brutally end someone's life. Because they're not talking after that, of course. Execution by molten metal was supposedly done to a wealthy Roman general, Marcus Licinius Crassus, back in ancient times. The metal would burn your muscles and skin, literally cooking it, and then after a few moments, it would harden. Bad, bad, not good. In our number five spot today, we have the Italian Renaissance dark side. Just at the tail end of the years of the medieval period, as we transitioned into the Renaissance period, began the Italian Renaissance. When we think of the Italian Renaissance period, it is known for the development and the rebirth that it caused, which makes a lot of sense considering the word Renaissance means rebirth. But there is one less glamorous and slightly frightening side to this period that isn't always spoken about. Sailors who had been returning from the New World at this point brought something less than lovely back with them, and that was syphilis, which spread through an entire French army. After this, the troops brought what was called the Great Pox to the rest of Europe. Since there was no penicillin back then, the disease spread rapidly and the symptoms were pretty gruesome. It would often happen that the person who had fallen ill would have the skin on their faces essentially be rotting away, which would leave large ulcers. Sometimes people's noses or lips would be pretty much gone, and it happened often that people would very sadly pass away from the disease. So basically, what we think of as a really beautiful time in Europe was both world changing, but also very scary and like, I don't know, kind of close to a zombie apocalypse. Number four, solitary confinement. This is a kind of punishment that still exists in our modern society, but it can truly be one of the worst punishments out there because of the type of psychological distress that it causes. We were all just in a pandemic for so long. We got so bored and we had Netflix and iPads and i whatevers. I can't even imagine this back in the day. Basically, it's a prisoner living in a single cell with little to no contact with anybody else. Not even like a guard or anything rattling keys like in the old times. It was just nothing. No one would even check on them. There are many stories about people being locked up for so long they forget about their families. And some people have gone away to solitary confinement for so long that once they're out, they just forget how to speak, really. They forget how to be a human and interact in the real world. Solitary confinement and the negative effects that it has on a person is becoming a wider topic of conversation because of the effects on a person's mental well-being, and it's a topic for a lot of human rights organizations. Back in medieval times, solitary confinement was literally just a room made of stones. It was pitch black, freezing cold, you were tucked away below some janky castle, and most of the time, you weren't really alone. In the dark, nibbling away your little piggies were. Number three, dyslexia for cure found. I don't know about you guys, but sometimes reading can be really hard. You've seen my blooper reel. I mean, I went to school, I got my grade 10, and that's really cool. Maybe soon I'll be able to go to college and get my PFD. But I wasn't a big fan of school. I just like to hang out with my friends. But then again, I did have the opportunity to attend school. The same cannot be said for poor peasants in the medieval age. Some wealthy kings would go as far as to ban the serfs from learning to read. Wouldn't want your population to be too smart, they might overthrow you 
after all. And sorry ladies, that means you aren't going either. Schools were boys clubs, no girls allowed. The richest of families could have their sons sent off to be a squire and eventually enter knightship for their royal throne. But this was for the very rich. I can't help but think that I would look good in all that metal armor though. Give me a sword, a shield, noble steed. I'm assuming the wealthy would let me go to school. Please sir, could I learn to read? It's disgusting. Number two, the breaking wheel. The breaking wheel is literally just a large disc, a pirate ship wheel almost just lying there where somebody is then tied to it and everybody else just hammers them and beats the shit out of them over and over. But of course, since we're talking about medieval times, everything has to be a show and whatnot. So once the accused was beaten and then presumed dead, the wheel would lift up and turn just to show everybody what's up. Another way to use the breaking wheel, yep, there was more than one, again, creative folks back then, they would tie a person to the wheel and then continue to rotate it and then all the ropes below would get tighter and tighter and twist. Kind of like the rack, but with a literal twist. And finally coming in at number one, the brazen bull. This one takes the rat's problem and then makes it a you problem. Out of all the ones on this list, the brazen bull is the last one that I would do straight up haunting. It's also been referred to as a Sicilian bull and basically it's not too complex. There is a bronze sculpture often in the shape of, you guessed it, a bull. But in medieval times, it was just a big closed cauldron and usually it was large enough to fit a person inside. Yeah, this was in a Saw movie too, I believe. That's how you know it's a good one when it's in the movie Saw. So once the person was locked inside or it was leaned over so they couldn't get out, a fire would then be set underneath this bull and then you can probably figure out the rest in your head. They would even engineer the bull so that when somebody screamed it sounded like a bull's roar. How fun is that? How fun is history? Number 10, the dancing plague. It was a normal summer day in 1518 Stroudsburg when all of a sudden patient zero began to twitch and move in a way that was so peculiar. No, this isn't the start of a medieval zombie movie, which actually sounds pretty cool. This was a plague like no other, the dancing plague. A dancing woman shortly began to gather a crowd and more people seemed to strangely dance. More people joined in and then it became the dancing plague, which lasted for days, strangely. Some were taken in for medical treatment for the strange behavior. Today, no one is really sure what happened. Some think it was the devil's work. Scientists today think it could have been a mold-induced psychotic incident. And other people think it could be just classic medieval hysteria. However, I'd like to think it was John Taverner's newest mixtape. Number 9. Rushed Wedding not all marriages back in the medieval times were for political and strategic gain. Some of it was actually for love. And some of it was extremely spontaneous. There wasn't even an official ceremony for a long time. And if you wanted to get married, the two of you just had to both give verbal consent, which is always a good idea. As you can imagine, this meant a lot of people would be getting legally bonded to each other in the streets, at the pubs, and while together in bed. Which... Mm, taking into account that people were considered old enough for marriage at obscenely young ages, they were not really thinking with their brains right then. But hey, life was short and love was fiery. But because of this, it was kind of hard to prove the whole thing. So we came up with a lovely way of confirming the whole situation. Number eight, Splash Zone. Let's get it on. Ooh, 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 baby, let's get it on. Ooh. Man, I love that song. I love the classics. You know, sometimes those moments in life require that special soundtrack. Like, when I'm gaming, I love synth pop. When I party, I'm a man enjoy some Drake. How you doing, buddy? And when it's time to get low, I like the official soundtrack of Shrek. <laughs> what can I say? Cinematic masterpiece. That being said, that's all that needs to happen in those intimate moments. For medieval times and in many places around the world, people would have to watch the signing off of the marriage. This included friends, family, local leaders, and maybe some nobility. You know, just to make sure the marriage uh, went through properly. <laughs> Gee, honey, I can't wait to go home and consummate the marriage. I figure if everyone shows up at 8, they can leave by 8.05. Maybe 8.02. Just stay out of the splash zone. Number seven, The Crusades. We hear about it a lot, but we need more movies and Netflix shows about this time because it's really rich in history here. A three-part miniseries spanning over like 300 years. These bloody and ruthless wars were battled between Muslim and Christians for proprietorship over sacred lands and lands in the Middle East. Wars that resulted in like six million deaths. The Knights Templar, of course, a brotherhood of highly trained soldiers, horseback, bashing their way through the East. These guys were the real deal, the Navy SEALs of their time. Richard I leading the third and final crusade him the name Richard the Lionheart. Yeah, 
Back then, the names were always something so aggressive and scary, you know? It wasn't ever like Richard the Billy Goat or Henry the Butterfly. Nah, we need fear. 300 years of religion, invasions, torture, political chess. It was the Wild West before the Wild West. Well, I guess the Wild East. The Wild Wild East, yeah. Number six, hairless. Nobody wants to go bald, just ask Jada Smith. Medieval times had different thoughts about this, however. Not only was a receding hairline normal, but that was the thing for ladies at the time. You might be thinking it's all about the waist, the legs, or the booty. Well, not back then. So, if the forehead is all the rage, focus on it, right? Makes sense. How is this done? Well, you can start by plucking those lashes. Don't need those. Then pluck the eyebrows. Ain't gonna need those either. And just start reeling back that hairline. Oh, perfect. Now you're ready for a night on the town. The history of women's fashion and traditions is a story of pain, beauty, and some really weird choices. Number five. War! What is it good for? Absolutely nothing. Say it again. War! What is it good for? Well, if you need oil, it actually kind of works out. Yes, it's warm, it's bad, it's naughty, and we've been doing it forever. I'm going to do more specifics, but I'll save that for a part two maybe, we'll see. I'm talking more about the brutality of medieval combat. Swords, shields, spears, pikes, halberds, axes, hammers, maces, bows, crossbows, catapults, trebuchets, rams, fire arrows, and if you're a fan of Ocarina of Time, ice arrows. I'm not sure how that works, but Link's magical, we'll go with it. The truth is, medieval combat was brutal, walking miles to every battle, sometimes with limited supplies, which meant sometimes armies pissed. Village. Mm hmm yeah, not nice. If you were injured in battle, there was a high chance that you would get infected. And then that's picture wrap for you. It's a time of knights and glory, but also a time of great war and loss. All a guy can hope for is that whatever knight is gonna cut me up like a sushi roll, well, at least I'd hope he had the decency to disinfect his weapons with their favorite brand of disinfectant. Come on, let's be serious here. Number four, bloodletting. Look, we all know that a lot of men in their mid-40s treat their bodies like a rusted out Chevy Tahoe. I'm one and the same. Yeah, it needs a lot of work, but dad got an oil change, so that makes it all that makes it all better. This was common back in medieval times. A simple fix or a one fix fits all for every health issue was, of course, bloodletting. The old drain you of your precious life juice so you can get a detox, bro. Look, at first glance, yeah, it makes sense. If my Chevy runs a wee bit better after an oil change, then why not? It makes sense. Well, the truth is, there really isn't any new blood going in, so it's not so much as an oil change as it is so much just draining you of your energy, bro. Did it really work? Ah, not really. Arguably, it made things worse. This was also a treatment to make your skin pale, and uh, as my previous point with the ladies, that was also seen as beautiful, so remember that. Go to blood clinic. Please don't drain your blood to look prettier. Number three, knights. Keeping with the themes of the medieval times, other outfits of highly trained religious secret organizations, knights, brotherhood, fighting, all that uh, good stuff. Another knightly order. The Order of Brothers of the German House of St. Mary in Jerusalem. Also commonly known as the Teutonic Order. Thousand years ago again. Kind of like the Templars being a Catholic religious institution founded as a military society. We're talking 1190 in Jerusalem. It was formed to aid Christians and protect them in the Holy Lands where they would establish hospitals and churches. The Order, more of a small voluntary outfit made up of mercenary military memberships. Basically old dogs who could still fight, we're looking to do some private security work. The Teutonic Knights were rich too, which led them to hire older and more experienced mercenaries from all parts of Europe. Dude, this is where all these secret societies started, huh? Couple initiations, couple tattoos, couple secret scars. A religious mercenary group who would just truck through Europe, swinging swords in the name of God. What a time. Number two, funeral rites. Medieval times, people were dropping like flies, just how things went. So, when it was time to deliver folks to their final resting place, some traditions were in order. For those that couldn't shake the Black Plague, they were put into big holes with the rest of the poor devils who couldn't also. Loved ones were taken care of with, well, great care and respect, and others, well, they had uh, modifications made to their graves. Like for instance, if you were suspected of being a vampire, well, you'd be buried with a giant boulder on top of you, just in case, you don't know. Maybe you decide to wake up and come back to town for a midnight snack. Gotta be careful. Some were buried without heads, uh, the list goes on. All I can say is keep your garlic close, your wooden stakes, and, and, and just always wash your hands, especially when handling the recently deceased. That's, you gotta get... Number one, duke it out. Couples in medieval Germany had an interesting way of figuring out their differences. Rather than just arguing like any normal couple, they took it to the octagon. 
Honestly, yeah, let's bring it back. Trial by single combat was a popular way to solve disagreements, and when man and wife were fighting, they had some great rules that had to be implemented. As one example, the husband had to stand in a hole with a hand behind his back while his wife got to run around with a sack filled with rocks. Seems a bit unfair, but hey, to each their own. I just imagine every time I have an argument with a girlfriend, and right in the middle of it, we just stop like, okay. I've had enough. We're settling this with our fisticuffs. Consult the marital duel rule book and have at thee, foul beast. Number 10, watch party. Marriage. Nothing like legally tying yourself to another human being for the rest of your life. Everyone loves a good wedding, but if I was invited to one in the Middle Ages, well, you can count me out of the final event. You see, it was popular at the time to prove your marriage is legit, and one way of doing that was consummating it. But we can't just take your word for it, don't be silly. No, instead, every member of your family, and maybe some members of the court if you're royal, will come with you into the bedchamber to spectate and make sure the deed is done. Imagine being the lady who would sometimes be carried to the chamber by her family members. Now, obviously, things were a little different then. Marriages were not really a thing of love, it was strictly business. And of course, they had different ideas of what exactly was private. So this is purely from our modern point of view, but I can imagine it was particularly uncomfortable having your least favorite cousin in the room. Number nine, Ivan the Terrible, the first Tsar of Russia. A man who was as cold and brutal as the winters that surrounded him. Ivan had it rough growing up. Both of his parents pulled a Bruce Wayne and passed away when he was very young. Afterwards, he and his siblings were not raised the best. Once described as having nothing but rags to wear, which in that climate must have been awful. So, did little Ivan grow up to be a super rich yet dark hero bent on serving the criminals of the night cold justice, just like his Gotham counterpart? No, no he did not. He became wealthy, but awful. Terrible, some might say. There are a hundred stories about Ivan and his cruelty, but my favorite is that of St. Basil Cathedral. You know the one. Anytime Russia is shown on TV, it's like a North Pole Christmas Onion Palace looking thing. You know the one I'm talking about. After it was completed, he had the architect's eyes gouged out so no one could ever build anything more beautiful. <sighs> Number eight. Red card. Actually, I doubt anyone was given a red card when they played soccer back in the day. It would have just been too difficult to even determine who it was exactly that got the card. The rules of the medieval precursor to soccer were pretty, um, basic. There basically weren't any. In Shrove Tide football, the goals could be a couple hundred yards to miles apart. There were an unlimited number of players, and the only rule literally says that you could use any means necessary to score apart from the actual ending of someone's life. It still happened though, even by accident, because you take every man from your village, or even from two different opposing villages, and you take one leather bladder ball and say, do whatever you can to score. People are gonna get punched, kicked, stomped on, trampled, bruised, bloodied, and de-lifed. This mob football was hated by lords and kings. Edward II, Edward III, Richard II, and Henry IV all tried to have it banned, but, well, have you ever met a football or soccer fan? Number seven, men's fashion. By far, one of the best ways to show that you are not one of the lowly plebeians back in medieval times would be your clothes. We've talked about how stripes were the pattern of the devil, but they had some weirder trends back in the Middle Ages. For example, long and pointy shoes were a very big sign of wealth, and the longer and pointier the shoe, the more gold pieces were lining your pocket. Men loved to show off their bodies back then too, but they didn't have BMWs back in the day. So one way a dude could compensate for himself was the aptly named codpiece, which was a pouch attached to the front of a man's pantaloons, perfectly shaped and padded to display their masculinity. It's like that one dad at the beach wearing the Speedo, except maybe a little less nightmare inducing. Number six, body on trial. And where were you on the night of April the 27th? You see, members of the jury, his stunned silence only proves his guilt. Pope Stephen VI was an interesting guy, but I think the most interesting thing he may have done was in 897 when he ordered Pope Formosus, the last guy in his position, dug up and put on trial. 
What's worse than digging up a dude and yelling at him in a courtroom, finding him guilty, taking away his papal finery and a few fingers, and then reburying him? Digging him back up again and throwing him in the Tiber River. Apparently, the whole thing was possibly a way of covering up the crimes that Pope Stephen had committed because, you see, this guy was one of the first popes to bring on what people call the most corrupt era in the history of the papacy. This pope didn't last too long, thanks to some unsurprising mob justice. And the next guy who became pope, thankfully, outlawed the whole mortal husk on trial thing. Number five, the Great Charter. Ah yes, time for some peace. Well, kinda. A peace treaty, the initial document containing specific grievances under King John's rule. The year is 1215. Since these animals can't follow the rules, maybe we need to jot up some rules to follow ourselves. A document setting out the laws and limitations for the common man to King John himself. A legal system written down so that there are clear do's and don'ts to follow, like no free man shall be seized, imprisoned, dispossessed, outlawed, exiled, or ruined in any way, nor in any way proceeded against except by the lawful judgment of his peers. And the Law of the land. Write all that down. Please write it down. Laws were important, and sometimes people needed to face the music. After John's death, the government of his son, Henry III, revised the document in 1216, dumbing it down in a little less strict and churchy book of rules type way. Less hearsay and more evidence kind of laws. Of course, still in folio, so V's were U's and L's were also the number one, so a little confusing sometimes, to say the least. Number four, not the kitties. We all know that apparently black cats are bad luck, and that two of them in a row signifies a glitch in the matrix. You have Pope Gregory IX to thank for that. In 1232, Greg wrote Vox in Rama, which supposedly exposed the rituals of a cult of witches that lived in northern Germany. Among some of the things they summoned, including the big red with horns himself, was a black cat that appeared to be kissed and adored by the worshippers. The Great Cat. You've already heard of witch hunters, well now you've heard of cat hunters. People took the great cat mentioned in Vox and Rama and applied that idea to every cat. And they did not hold back, like at all. The cat population almost got to extinction point. Didn't work out too well for them when rat populations saw a huge increase not too much later though, huh? Touch my cat and you ain't making it to tomorrow, that's all I'm saying. Number three, feast of fools. Before the church took the fun of going overboard out of pretty much everything, every January 1st in France, the whole social hierarchy got topsy-turvy with the Feast of Fools. No, this was not a festival promoting fool-related cannibalism. Instead, the highest respected religious officials swapped with the lowest, and serving maids became masters with a king of misrule being crowned. The event was meant to display the biblical phrase, God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. Which is a creative excuse for parades, comic performances, costumes, cross-dressing, song, and naturally, way too much drinking. But like I said, thanks to the rowdy merrymaking and obscenities, the church was forced to ban it. Sad. Number 2. Pope Not-So-Innocent III Look, I'm sorry I'm talking about Pope so much, but you gotta know that a heck of a lot of horrible things that happened in the Middle Ages were caused by the decisions of the church, and specifically, that one little decision of forcefully dealing with anyone who disagrees or insults your religion. For example, in 1209, there was a group of heretics called the Cathari in southern France who believed that the Roman Catholic Church itself was established by the same people who brought an end to the life of Christ. Now. That didn't really fly too well with Pope Innocent III, who in response launched the Albigensian Crusade that became a 20 year long full military campaign. A particular event that's worthy of mention here is when the Crusaders took the town of Toulouse. The soldiers couldn't figure out who the heretics were among the people there, so Commander Simon de Montfort said, destroy them all, the devil will know his own. That's messed up, dude. Number one, something going around. Another warfare related one here, but this one is just awful. I'll make this one brief. Basically, you got a castle that needs entering or a palace that needs a good siege. You get your catapults ready, you load them up with the secret sauce. And by that, I mean these bad boys were loaded with the latest commoners who had succumbed to the bubonic plague. Yes, they were launching plague bodies over walls in hopes that it would make the enemy sick. And sometimes, they would even fling some poop over there. Oof. It's such a smart move though, right? It's just so heinous and gross. 
When it was all said and done, I bet there was no hand washing to be found. Disgusting. Number 10, universities. Okay, owing a lot of school debt myself, I know a little thing or two about the educational institution. But when did they start? And where? And why? Universities have been around for like the last 13,000 years, apparently, with the newest uncovered Gobekli Tepe being flirted with possibly being the first university or educational hotspot in the world. But uni uni with like school colors and teams and stuff, that's straight middle high ages right there. University of Oxford was created in 1096. That's the classic riddle, isn't it? Which is older, the Aztecs or Oxford? Ever heard that one before? Yeah, these things are like old, old. A university for law and medicine was created in the year of 1088, the University of Bologna in Italy. Yeah, it became a thing when an organized group of students under the Latin motto of quote, nourishing mother of the studies was created. Pretty academic, if you ask me. University of Cambridge, 1209. Like, this is like almost a thousand years ago, y'all. At least some of the Middle Ages had some some good traditions, along with like how to sever heads for court and stuff like that. I wonder if someone still owes school debt from like 1208, you know? Five shillings a month kind of deal. Number nine, Hastings. Medieval times wouldn't really be the medieval times without a couple of hundreds of swords clinking and clanking against a couple of other hundreds of swords clinking and clanking. Well, thousands actually. Hand-to-hand -hand combat was a crucial part of business back in the day. New treaty signed, new land discovered, usually started and ended with a battle. The Battle of Hastings, one of the most important important battles of the Middle Ages. Norman French army of William, the Duke of Normandy, and the English army under the Anglo-Saxon King Harold Godswinson. The childless King Edward the Confessor in 1066 set up a succession struggle between families and the throne. Harold was crowned king after Edward's death, but faced invasion by William and the Norwegian King Harold III of Norway. The battle lasted from dusk till dawn, and William was crowned as king on Christmas Day 1066. Continued rebellions and resistance to Williams continued, but Hastings marked the start of this ancient British rule and cemented their place amongst Europe as the leading power in both army, academia, and religion. Basically, a really key time where everyone was fighting, Game of Thrones style for Europe. Like all of Europe. Lots of swords and heads type stuff. Number eight, taxes. Hey, tax season's coming up. Make sure you have everything nice and neatly organized. I know I don't. But why do we have to do them, you know? Where does this you owe me this come from? The Domesday Book or the Doomsday Book was a book created under William I, also known known as William the Conqueror. The same name victor in the battle we just talked about. So medieval to name yourself the victor, isn't it? It is I, Kyle, the winner. Yeah, this guy basically drew up a book to document people's money so that he could tax them. Oh yeah, this was the first time surveyors kind of went town to town and recorded how much money you would owe for just doing you. Men would just show up at your house asking how much you made and document your spending habits. Five shillings on groceries, huh, Mildred? Right, and just another five for the phone plan. <sighs> Tax season's coming up. Talk about a bunch of crooks, huh? Owing someone money for just living on their land, trying to make an honest living? How dare they? Thank God that didn't catch on. Speaking of, I got a phone H&R Block. Number seven, human decorations. Sticking with the theme of crazy dudes from Europe comes one of the craziest, Vlad the Impaler. Sure, Ivan was bad, but imagine being so bad, so awful, that your alias is a verb for what you do to people. So specific. For example, Adam would be Adam the talker during movies. Ugh, worse. Or Adam the bedwetter. Not that I've ever wet the bed or anything. <laughs> Don't even ask. Don't ask my mom. What? Well, Vlad has this weird knack for decorating. The enemies of his kingdom would meet a terrible fate. Think of how bad a toothpick would hurt if someone poked you with it. Okay, now imagine it's a large, sharp wood pike that some lovely gentleman would sit you on. Ugh. As you slowly become one with the pike, you look around and see a field of others who have also met the same fate. The sky turns blood red. Black thick clouds form as the moon beams through and shines down on the beast of a man who would dare do this to his people. Vlad the Impaler, a man who did unspeakable things and was the inspiration for Dracula. Who knew, right? Who thought? Who, who, who thought? Number six, court. Yeah, I'm not gonna lie. Peter would have an absolute field day with this next one. But again, it's like a thousand years ago and people were not really sure what they were doing back then. Some things were innovative and great. And then there was like trying a rat before a court of law for eating food. Yeah. It's 1386 in the Norman city of Falaise, and ruthless and a rowdy crowd gathered to witness the execution of the city's most infamous convicted murderer. Spectators dressed in their best, and the prisoner was even given a last suit and a last meal for the occasion. I hereby sentence Mr. Wigglesworth to beheading. <gasps> Gasps everywhere. Yeah, a pig. Yeah, they tried a pig and sentenced it to a beheading. Like, 
Also, isn't that just called breakfast? For more than like 300 years all throughout Europe, strange lawsuits tried pigs, dogs, foxes, birds, even grasshoppers and slugs for crimes. Basically anything against people, property, and God himself. It started with creatures who had maimed or killed humans of importance, then animals that stole and ate crops, then like the snail made me do it type stuff. Yeah. Prosecution after prosecution. This stuff's weird, right? Your Honor, a small recess, please. Okay, basically what we're gonna tell them is that Number five, animal court. Oh, did you think the courtroom was a place only for members of the human species? <laughs> Au contraire. In fact, all kinds of members of the animal kingdom, from insects to dolphins, would stand trial if they were believed to be guilty of crimes. Some animals were executed, some received strongly worded letters, and some were even proven not guilty. A rooster was once given the verdict of guilty for laying eggs. Truly the most unnatural of crimes. Pigs were usually the ones who got the most amount of court time, with one account even having a pig dressed in a waistcoat, gloves, pants, and a human mask to meet his end. I wonder if these animals were judged by a jury of their peers. Hmm. Number four, Templars. The poor fellow soldiers of Christ and of the Temple of Solomon. I feel like you have to say that with a deep voice or it sounds weird. The Knights Templar, aka the Order of Solomon's Temple, or simply the Templars. Basically a Catholic military order group of one of the most wealthiest military groups in all of history. No pressure. Founded in 1119, based out of the Temple Mount in Jerusalem, a couple hundred years of this Navy SEALs type organization. Endorsed and encouraged under the Roman Catholic Church of Pope Innocent II. What a name. The Templars, an extremely trained super soldier outfit with the distinctive white mantles with the red cross. They were like the most skilled fighting units out of the entire Crusades Wars. What people don't know is about 90% of the organization was behind closed doors, ranging a network of financial techniques, manipulations, and treaties for the next thousands of years. Yeah, everybody focuses on the fighting part, but the chess game being played economically at the same time behind closed doors was much more terrifying. Basically, the world's first corporation with a security team. Number three, criminal cook-off. Criminals, they're everywhere and have been since the dawn of time. It also seems that since the dawn of time, people have been coming up with lots of different ways to deal with said criminals. One of the medieval favorites of the Holy Roman Empire was boiling criminals in oil. Nice! Save for the truly heinous crooks and those who dare defraud coinage. Yes, that's right, don't dare fraud the coin or you could end up like last night's suckling duck. Boiling oil was even used in defense during castle sieges. Get too close to the walls and, well, you'd get a boiling barrel of Crisco's finest as hair grease. Boiling oil leaves horrible burns and is extremely painful. I don't know, I shouldn't have to tell you that. If you ever cook bacon without a shirt on, then you know. The kind of grit you need to stay close to that sizzling pan, I, I envy you. Because yeah, those things totally relate though, absolutely. Number two, jesters. In the 12th century, the title of Fool began, aka the jester was born. A paid career of mockery, smut, laughter, and tricks. A true triple threat. Most of the time, after years of service, these jesters were rewarded with land as payment for their loyal service. A famous fool named Roland Le Pateur was given 30 acres of land by King Henry II when he retired after his foolery, under one condition, that every Christmas day, Roland would return to the royal court to leap, whistle, and fart. Yeah. Just a whole year to write a seven minute banger of a set. No pressure. But it wasn't just farts and jokes for these guys apparently. Jesters also had a huge role in battles. At war, their job was to wage psychological warfare, boosting the morale of their side the night before with laughter, parties, and stories. And in the morning, when the two armies met, the jesters would ride or run between them, calming the nerves of their own side and men by making them laugh, singing silly songs, of course, and insulting the opposition. Yeah, just chirping the other team. This was a ballsy tradition. And most of the time, unfortunately, they were captured and sent catapulted back with a message from the other side. Imagine just taunting 5,000 bloody drooling men hopped up on IPAs and no sleep, just mocking them, like, to their face. No thanks. Number one, sports. Yeah, back then it wasn't a friendly game of handshakes and sportsmanship and stuff. More like no rules kind of sports. Like no rule soccer, AKA mob soccer. Yeah, I'm not talking about the mafia mob. I'm talking about a mob as an unruly amount of people running amongst each other in havoc. Yeah, town versus town. An unlimited amount of players. There was only two rules of this game. Get the inflated pig's bladder over the opposing team's line on the other side of town and no murdering. Yeah, no murdering. Okay, 
So this is rugby. This sounds a lot like medieval rugby, doesn't it? This game was played competitively and eventually outlawed even at Oxford University in 1555. Secret fraternities and training areas were all agreed on by each organization. The game got so competitive, bloody and out of hand, it was eventually banned at tons of different times in England. Quote, There is great noise in the city caused by hustling over large balls from which many evils may arise which God forbids. We command and forbid on behalf of the king on pain of imprisonment such a game to be used in the city in the future. Damn. Like band band, huh? Thankfully the game of football has calmed down over the years. <laughs> yeah, right. Just go to a Manchester versus Liverpool game. Yeah.